Here tonight is part of our uh, new uh, Paquette Innovation Initiative. The project is to uh, make the Paquette plant a center for the celebration of innovation. After all, innovation is the heart of, of the Paquette experience. It's in our DNA. And uh, we want to be relevant to the community and society at large. And one way of doing that is to encourage innovation and to celebrate it. We're here at CCS tonight, uh, and the Root Brothers are presenting to us the rollout of their project, which is uh, the race car that never was, the spirit of Detroit. And these young men have started combining modern technology with old-fashioned hard work and innovation to create a new product, their dream race car. It's inspired by the Model T, and so it's important that Piquette be involved. All right. So I guess everybody's here. Um, so I'll introduce myself if I've not already met you. I'm Ryan Root, and this is my twin brother, David Root. And this is our Spirit of Detroit project. And to start off tonight, um, I think we're going to talk a little bit about innovations at the Paquette plant. And for that, I will introduce Jerry Mitchell. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yep. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. We appreciate the invitation by CCS and by the brothers to participate in this program. Uh, from the time we opened our doors in 2000, we've had a wonderful working relationship with CCS, as students and faculty, and we're glad to be here again. Also, this is a very special night for us because uh, our participation in your program is our initial uh, event and a new program we've developed called uh, the Paquette Plant Initiative, Innovation Initiative. And the purpose is to highlight, celebrate innovation. As you know, the Fort Piquet Avenue plant is a center of innovation. It's in our DNA. And many people know that, um, of course, innovation took place there in terms of automobile design and manufacturing. Many people do not realize, though, that there are many other areas of innovation, such as uh, dealership development, automobile advertising, labor relations, things like that. So we are a center of innovation, and we want to help celebrate that. And you and your fellow students here are the innovators of the future. So it's very appropriate that uh, we be here. Um, my remarks were designed for students. So you more senior people can just uh, tune out if you like. We'll take notes. OK, take notes. All right, let me get my notes, by the way, so I don't forget something important. It's great to see all the energy here. So, you are the next generation of innovators. And geographically, I can't imagine you're being in a better location. Here you are in the General Motors building, which is dedicated to innovation. And two blocks that way is the site of the Henry Ford Company, Mr. Ford's second car enterprise. And uh, four blocks this way is the Paquette plant, the birthplace of the Model T. And just a few blocks down Cass Avenue was Henry Ford's clandestine garage where he secretly worked on his race car. And he did this under the radar of his shareholders. In contrast, you are both going online and telling the entire world about what you're doing. That's how times have changed. I think that's wonderful. So, the geography is wonderful. Temporally, I can't imagine being in a better century than the 21st century if you're going to be an innovator, because this is the age of innovation. And I'd like to make some brief remarks tonight to help set your project. I'm going to attempt to set your project in a broader context, a historical context, and a contemporary context. And I hope you don't think I'm preaching to you, but I think I have wisdom to share. Uh, first 100 years, as you know, America was an agrarian society. But very early, even in the 18th century, a very vigorous debate started developing about what was going to be the role of science and technology in America's history. Theologians were concerned about scientific discoveries threatening people's faith and scientific discoveries and industrialization creating materialism and being uh, threatening the dignity of the worker in factories, things like that. On the other hand, there was a smaller number of people who had already picked up 
that things were changing in Europe, that the Enlightenment had occurred, that science was on the move, and that America should not be just agrarian, as many people saw it. Most people saw America as a paradise for agrarian society, unlimited land. Others saw it as a possible site for new technology and the progress in the future. Now, as you know, what showed the power of steam in England brought about the Industrial Revolution. It was mind-boggling. Robert Fulton in 1807 brought that awareness to Americans by creating his first successful steamship. And with that, this latent pragmatism in the American spirit was unleashed and a huge frenzy of invention took place thereafter. And it continues to today, and you are part of that long tradition. Now this frenzy of uh, invention occurred and accelerated throughout the 19th century. By the 1870s, Thomas Edison and others had actually invented a way to invent. And this is one of America's greatest contributions to civilization. We devised, we invented a way to invent. And Thomas Edison established Menlo Park, which was an invention factory. It was designed to make inventions, inventing efficient and effective and economical. And others quickly followed. At the same time, academia was developing towards science. Now Harvard and Yale and the schools back east had been established as divinity schools in the 18th century. They were a little bit slow and reluctant to pick up on science. And so a group of entrepreneurs, primarily in Boston, for example, said, okay, they're not cooperating. We will establish our own university. And they set up Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a school dedicated exclusively to the advancement of science and technology. And this was rapidly followed by others, Caltech and many others. At the same time, Congress had established the uh, land-grant colleges to use science to help effectively develop our natural resources in agriculture. And then industry began to realize that it's important to bring inventors into companies. And then you had to establish some great things like the Westinghouse Laboratory, the Bell Laboratory, and so forth. And so suddenly you had in place individual inventors, universities dedicated to science and technology, land-grant colleges dedicated to practical application of science and technology, growing industries that depended on technology, and a wonderful synergy began to develop between all of these entities. And the synergy today between science and industry is a hallmark of America. It's part of our worldview. And today, no one doubts the need for ever-accelerating innovation. It's no longer a question. It's accepted as a fact of life. So everyone's for it. Now, you're fortunate to live in the 21st century, but this century is entirely different in many ways from previous times, principally because we have learned a lot through 150, 200 years of technological experience. We have learned a very important lesson, and that is that technology has unforeseen consequences. And we've learned that technology has profound impacts, can have profound impacts on people's lives and the world in which we live. And so where in the past, previous generations of inventors, they could invent without restraint. I'd like to propose to you that innovators of your generation need to adopt a slightly different strategy. You need to think in terms of the consequences of what you choose to do. And you should ask yourself, I think it'd be wise to ask yourself, is what I'm proposing to do, is it good for the planet, bad for the planet, or neutral? And factor that into your thinking. Because no matter how wonderful your innovation, it's going to be undercut. And no matter how wonderful your profits, they won't be fully enjoyed if we live on a planet that's in crisis. And I think your generation is tuning in on this very effectively. So I'm very, very confident your generation is going to be a generation which will move us forward responsibly 
And whereas your predecessors invented a way to invent, I think your generation of inventor, innovators will be called upon to bring about ways of innovation that innovate in a way that is friendly to the earth and our future. So I wish you every success, and we're honored to be here and hope to be able to be helpful to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, so wow. Uh, thanks, Jerry. That was uh, really awesome. And um, so I guess I'll just start off with our project here, uh, the Spirit of Detroit. It started about six months ago for us when we started this whole project, and we first had the idea probably a year ago. Um, um, when we started this project, we made a video, and the video kind of helped to explain what the project was about and what we wanted to do. Uh, we put the video online on a GoFundMe page to help raise some money to build the model there. And our campaign was very successful. We raised $3,000 and were able to build the model and our display to present it with. Um, so we've got the video here, and I don't know if you guys have already seen it, but we'll just go ahead and play it. I think it does a pretty good job of summing up what we're all about and uh, what our intentions are for this project. We want to build hot rods the way they want to be built, with our hands and by skilled craftsmen. We want to build hot rods with the genuine materials that cars were originally created with. We want to put that level of artistry and craftsmanship that cars were first produced with back into hot rods that are made right here in the Motor City. So the spirit of Detroit is our interpretation of a vintage American uh, race car. Um, something that could have competed with the really prestigious German race cars of the 1930s. We want to build this race car to race at the race of gentlemen, and we hope to do it within the next two years. Oh, my brother, your wisdom is older than me. We're inspired by the early days of automotive racing when people's uh, passion and hard work drove innovation and progress. Back in these days, uh, people really had passion in their cars, and automotive racing uh, was really only for the brave. Racing has always been about this connection between man and machine, but today modern race cars have offset this balance, and they've almost became tame. So what we want to do is almost preserve this ferocity of vintage race cars and put it back into every single hot rod that we build. So right now, the hot rod industry is experiencing a new trend with the popularity of automotive heritage of the 1920s through the 1940s. So at the same time, we're also experiencing this Americana movement, which is sweeping our nation, especially in cities that have like deep roots, um, just like Detroit, Michigan. So really, if you think about it, Detroit is the perfect place to reintroduce a product that puts emphasis on craftsmanship and quality, as well as the can-do attitude of early American hot rodding. Detroit has kind of fallen on hard times, but the resiliency of the city has kind of started this revived Detroit attitude. So we hope to make the spirit of Detroit just the first of our many builds. So we ultimately want to open up a shop here in the Motor City to kind of aid to this Detroit revival. When you think about the hot rodding industry, it really revolves around people and their love for history and their passion for automobiles, which makes Detroit the perfect place because Detroit is founded upon automotive history and the people here really have a passion for automobiles. Well, 
what we're seeking funding for is the fabrication of our third scale model of the Spirit of Detroit, as well as the fabrication of our display booth for the Detroit Autorama. Some of the things that can get pretty pricey with building a third scale model is the 3D printing, the rapid prototyping, and the paintwork. Also, we're seeking funding for the display booth so it can reflect the professional intentions that we have for our project. You can also support our project by sharing the link to our GoFundMe page or uh, liking us on Facebook and Instagram. And with you guys' help, we hope to make the spirit of Detroit a success. So, perfect. The video kind of summed up the broad picture of what the spirit of Detroit is about and kind of what our end goals for this project are. So now I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the concept behind the car and what we designed the Spirit of Detroit to do. So to start off, the Spirit of Detroit is a 1936 race car. It's a Model T. It was designed to go across the ocean and compete against the prestigious German race cars of the 1930s, like the Auto Union and the Mercedes W125. Now these cars back in their day, they were the standard for European motor racing. The things that went into these cars, the engineering, was just beautiful. So I thought it would be perfect to have an American race car that went and competed against them because back in 1936, the U.S. and Germany had a very tense relationship and we were competing against them in almost every sporting event there was. From the 1936 Olympics with the greats like Jesse Owens to the boxing matches between Joe Lewis and Max Schmeling. Very, very iconic events. But there was one sporting event that the U.S. never competed with Germany in, and that was auto racing. The, the German auto racing cars were so much more advanced than any other racing car on the face of the earth. I think um, the auto union from 1935 to 1937 won over 25 European Grand Prix races. And the Mercedes W125 in 1937 won first, second, third, and fourth place in the European Grand Prix. So very, very impressive things. There's even stories of the auto union having serious issues with wheel spin at speeds over 150. I don't know of many sports cars today that can break the rear tires loose at speeds of over 150. So very, very impressive for 1936. So what we did to design our car is I looked into <coughs> Ford's history and the racing that was going on in 1936 and I stumbled across an interesting story. And that's the story of the Miller Ford race cars. So some of you probably know a lot about the Miller Ford race cars. Um, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of them today. And hopefully I can teach you guys something you didn't know. So you all probably know the Miller Ford race cars were designed for the 1935 Indianapolis 500 by a man named Harry Miller and also Preston Tucker. Um, but there was one problem with these cars. They all had one fatal design flaw which would prove to be devastating for the cars and also Ford's involvement in motor racing for almost 30 years. So to start the story off, it all started in 1935. Some of the stuff that was going on in 1935 was the Dust Bowl out west and also there were outlaws like Bonnie and Clyde and John Dillinger that were in their heyday. And the uh, Indianapolis 500 was in the 24th running, so from 1911 to 1935 these Indy cars had seen major advancements in technology. So there was a man named Preston Tucker that was living in Indianapolis, Indiana, that was fascinated about the Indy cars that were racing around him. So he had an idea for an Indy car that he thought could win the 1935 Indy 500. And his idea for the car was to create an Indy car that had independent suspension as well as an aerodynamic streamlined body. So this was very, very uh, conceptual thinking back then in 1935. So once he had this idea, he then thought and contacted his good friend Harry A. Miller. Now Harry A. Miller was probably the most renowned race car designer of the 1930s. Harry Miller designed some of the most uh, important things in racing from the Offenhauser engine, which was a standard in Indy racing for almost 30 years. So he presents his project to Harry Miller. And Harry Miller is on board. He joins the team. So now he's got an engineer and a designer, probably the best there is. Now he needs funding for the project. So who does Preston Tucker go to? None other than his other best friend, Edsel Ford. So he goes to Edsel Ford. Him and Harry Miller present Edsel this project that they're working on. 
and um, Edsel totally likes it. So he agrees to give them a contract. Now the contract was for 10 Miller Ford race cars. But the only problem with this contract was is they signed it in February of 1935. And the Indy 500 is in May. So this leaves them only four months to build 10 fully functional race cars. It's impressive stuff even by today's standards. So of course, um, Preston Tucker and Miller accept this offer. And they begin fabrication of these 10 cars. Um, so May rolls around, and the Indy 500 is knocking on the door. And they only get four cars done. Well, that's still pretty impressive for a car a month back in 1935. So they take these cars to the Indy 500, all four of them, and they go out for qualifying and practice, and the cars perform just like they should. Um, they per performed flawlessly. So they go into race day, and the team is very optimistic about winning the race. So on race day, all four cars pull out on the racetrack. And for about the first 50 laps, the cars did exactly what they were supposed to do. But then the design flaw becomes apparent of what the major issue was. Now, the major issue with the cars was a mount on the top of the valve cover of the flathead motor that connector that supported the steering shaft. Now, flathead motors, they run very, very high, as you guys probably know. So the heat from the motor radiated through this bracket into the steering shaft and then down into the steering box. And this fried all the grease out of the steering box, causing it to seize up. So from lap 50 on, the car slowly dropped out of the race, one by one by one, until they were all out. Um, so Henry Ford, very, very frustrated by this event and almost embarrassed, comes back to Detroit and pulls the plug on his involvement in motor racing. And for almost 30 years, Henry Ford will not return back to uh, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway or motor racing. So um, after the race, the four cars that were in the race returned to Detroit. And then the other six cars that were at Harry Miller's workshop um, go into storage here in Detroit. Henry Ford, frustrated, throws them in storage and locks the door. They sat there for several, several years. Eventually, the cars leaked out of storage and returned to Indy, and some of them having semi-successful racing careers once they replaced the motors with Offenhausers. So that is the story of the Miller Ford, and that's what inspired our Spirit of Detroit story. So now I'll kind of tell you how I plug the Spirit of Detroit into the Miller Ford story. So the Spirit of Detroit came about while Harry Miller and Preston Tucker were thrashing on these race cars for four months long. Preston Tucker gets word about these European cars, these German cars that were just terrorizing the European Grand Prix circuit. And he hears about the technologies going into them. And he gets the idea and says, man, I think this technology that I'm putting into my Miller Ford cars could be something to go over there and we could compete with these, with these Germans. You know, we're competing with them in every other sporting event. I think I could be the guy that competes with them in motor racing. So he goes to no other than Edsel Ford to seek funding for the spirit of Detroit. So Edsel Ford, being the flamboyant guy he was and loving the spotlight, he says, I want to be the guy who goes over there and defeats these prestigious German race cars. So he 100% backs the project and supports it. So while they're working on the Miller Ford cars, now they have another project to work on, the Spirit of Detroit project. So they go to Indy in May, and the Miller Fords, they fall on their face, and they embarrass Henry Ford. So Henry pulls the plug on the Miller Ford cars, and in turn, that pulls the plug on our Spirit of Detroit project. So. Um, the spirit of Detroit kind of being maybe a, a, a controversial topic back then, uh, they decide to have the entire project demolished, scrapped, along with all the blueprints and uh, molds associated with it. But there was one blueprint that made it through, and that's it. This is our spirit of Detroit. That's the spirit of Detroit. Yeah, and uh, I'll just kind of tell you guys about the innovations that we use on our project, and then how innovations like these could benefit the hot rod industry and the classic car industry. And I'll start off uh, and tell you guys a little bit about the design process we went through on this project. We started off with a research phase and we went down to Cincinnati and looked at some uh, old Indy cars and then we went to the Paquette plant a couple times and learned a lot about the history of Detroit. 
and it was really good for us and it really helped to uh, get a basis for our project. Once we did that, we moved into a packaging phase and we looked at a bunch of different platforms and drivetrains and we kind of picked the ones that we thought would work best for what we wanted to accomplish with our car. Once we did that, we got to do the really fun part. Uh, that was to find out what this thing was going to look like. So we did lots and lots and lots of sketches and tried a bunch of different shapes and designs. Uh, once we had a, a general idea of what we thought it would look like, we then went into a uh, digital modeling phase where we took our 2D sketches and renderings, uh, put them on the computer and created a 3D model. Uh, we used this 3D model to mill our third scale model and create uh, the model we have here today. Um, the next phase that we're going to go into is the final phase, and that is taking all this work and then making it reality and turning this third scale model into a full scale hot rod. So that's the exciting part. And the, uh, the first thing I'll talk to you guys about uh, that we did is digital modeling. And it's a, it's a, it's a good process and it's kind of new. And I think it's going to make a big splash in the hot rod industry because it's enabling companies that haven't usually had access to uh, five axis and three axis mills. Now these small mom and pop shops can have one off parts for their hot rods at a relatively inexpensive price. Um, for this model, we used a program called Alias. It's a class A surfacing tool used by most of the OEMs. Um, we use it to create the model and then from there, we sent this model to a five axis mill and we milled it out of 40 pound design foam. It's really dense stuff. This model probably weighs, probably weighs about 40 pounds, so it's pretty heavy. Um, and that was the model we built. And the next thing I'll talk about is uh, 3D printing. All the small parts on this car, the wheels and the grill, all this stuff was 3D printed. Um, and it really cut the production time in half for all this stuff. I couldn't even imagine having to spoke these wheels by hand. We would have spent weeks doing it. But with 3D printing, we created all four wheels for this car in six hours. Um, so that was uh, really good for us. And when we made them, too, um, since it's a spoked wheel, we only made two spokes. And we used the computer program to rotate it. And it rotated all around. So we only made a small section of this wheel. And it probably took a couple hours. And then six hours on the printer, and they're done. To make them by hand, it would have been. The, uh, the 3D printed parts on this one were uh, done on a printer that was pretty similar to an uh, inkjet printer. Uh, it's got two nozzles on it, one that goes through and it prints out the, it lays down as the thin layer uh, of liquid plastic, and then behind that's another head with an ultraviolet light that immediately hardens the plastic. Um, so when you get done, these parts can be done at super high tolerances, and they just require a really light sanding. Uh, just scuff them up and then paint them just that quick. Um, and then. Uh, the next thing I'll talk to you guys about was the final stage of our project, which we're about to do, is uh, build this car in full scale. Um, our plan for that, we're going to do it just like you would any other hot rod or uh, a custom car. We're going to start off with a Model T chassis. Uh, from there, we'll get all of our suspension parts and components together and put some wheels on and make it what's called a roller. Um, once we have a roller, we'll uh, find our power plant. For this car, we chose to use a Ford flathead V8 with an overhead valve conversion. Uh, it's a really neat motor, and it's uh, really uh, correct to the time era, and they were making a lot of power back in the day, so that's what we chose to use for this one. And they sound cool. They do sound cool. <laughs> um, the, next, the next thing that we'll do is create a sheet metal buck, because we're going to build this car. The body will be made out of uh, hand-formed aluminum, and what we'll do is exactly what I did here in third scale. I used the 3D model that I made, and I put it in a program called 123D Make. 123D Make, right. Um, in this program, I was able to cut sections of my model, and it would give me the exact profile of certain pieces, and then it splines them so I can just connect them together super, uh, super simple. Like a puzzle. Like a, yeah, like it's a, a puzzle. Um, for this model, we laser cut it, but for the uh, full scale buck, we'll water jet out all the pieces out of uh, plywood. Um, this model probably took maybe three hours to make, and a full-scale one I think we could do in one day using our 3D model and the technologies we have available. So it's a lot faster than the old school way of actually drafting out the individual segments in a buck. Now we can do it in 20 minutes on the computer. Right. Um, and once we have that buck, we'll 
uh, go to a coach builder and we'll work with them to build the aluminum body for this car, which is going to be another big process for us. Um, but it's really important to have the, the correct shape and uh, uh, design that we're looking for. And then the final process is going to be our favorite, uh, is paint and body. That's what we uh, grew up doing with our dad painting race cars. So we're ex uh, you know, we'll be excited for that process. Um, and that kind of wraps up what our plan is for the Spirit of Detroit project. Um, and like I said, we're going to graduate in May, and then we're going to go into the next step of building this thing full scale. Um, and then if you guys are still interested, we'll be at the Detroit Autorama. We have a booth that's going to be probably about this size in the basement. Um, we'll have our model there and presentation. Um, we'll have a little drafting table there. We'll be doing some renderings and drawings there, too. So if you're there, just uh, feel free to stop by and say hi. Um, and then, of course, I want to thank you guys for coming tonight. Uh, it's really a great opportunity for us people to present to you guys. And I also want to thank everyone that uh, donated and helped our project so far, too. Um, without these people, it wouldn't be, we wouldn't have gotten this far. And I'm really excited to see where this project goes in the future. So thank you all. It's called the Spirit of Detroit because we really want to include the city because this city was a city of innovation and uh, it was a hub of manufacturing and we really want to highlight that in our project here. We're excited more than ever to bring this car to reality. Um, we made a lot of good connections, we met a lot of really good people at the Paquette Museum and I think it's really going to be instrumental in constructing and, and bringing this thing to life. Yeah, we really look forward to the next step.